Well, I thank you, um, everybody, for being here today. I know um, probably among the topics we've, um, you know, presented on uh, over the years, this is probably one of the harder ones, uh, one of the heavier topics for sure. So I appreciate everybody being here. Um, certainly appreciate any insight um, and perspective that um, you all can bring. Um, again, you know, I guess our hope today is to be able to, um, you know, provide some tools, some resources, kind of normalize what some of you might be experiencing um, you know, pr prepare you and sort of uh, provide an understanding of what psychiatric symptoms can look like, how we manage those when they escalate, you know, how to address that. And then if inpatient um, psychiatric evaluation and um, inpatient care is needed, you know, kind of what to expect and how to best prepare you for that. Um, so that's our goal. Um, we know that I think for all of us, um, you know, involved in caring for these patients, it's probably one of the most challenging, frustrating and distressing um, aspects of the illnesses. Um, so again, hopefully, um, we can leave today with some tools and resources to make um, things a bit easier, um, kind of to preface this, you know, this isn't something that, um, everybody who, um, has a diagnosis of dementia, or Parkinson's will experience certainly, um, but when you do, it's certainly significant, um, and, yeah, um, can certainly impact quality of life from um, safety. So, um, I think just kind of the outline um, of what we're hoping to cover today is um, just kind of defining some of the psychiatric symptoms that um, we can see as part of these diagnoses. Um, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, both non-medication and medication management. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, when symptoms escalate, how to identify that and kind of how to, how to address that. Um, and then also talk about, you know, when um, inpatient psychiatric care might be indicated and how to seek that care. And then also, you know, once you're kind of in that process, what to expect. Um, and then also, so, you know, sort of how we at Membrane Movement can couple with you um, when you're going through that process, um, you know, and, and preparing to discharge. And then also just kind of having a crisis plan um, for, for those instances where things do escalate. Okay. okay, so we'll jump in and get started. Um, so just want, kind of want to define um, a little bit some of the symptoms that we're going to talk about today. Um, these aren't all encompassing, certainly, um, but probably some of the most common or, or more distressing. Um, so I know there was a question um, that was posed prior to the presentation about when, you know, when do we see these symptoms? At what point in the disease process do we see them? And I think it can be a little bit different depending on the diagnosis. Um, you know, for something like um, for the temporal dementia with the behavioral variant, they can, they can certainly present early on. Um, additionally, with Lewy body dementia, hallucinations um, can present um, as one of the presenting symptoms. Uh, for a, di like a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, typically that occurs when the disease is more advanced or advancing. Um, and then like Parkinson's related cognitive impairment um, or Parkinson's related psychosis, again, that's usually when the disease is more advanced. Again, that doesn't mean um, that everyone with a diagnosis of dementia or Parkinson's will experience these symptoms, but if they are experienced, typically they're, you know, at more advanced stages, just depending on the type of illness we're talking about. Um, so just again, to go through some of the symptoms and define them. So we um, kind of know, you know, what we're referring to as we're talking about these. So anxiety, of course, excessive worry, rumination, nervousness um, that can manifest in physical symptoms, you know, sweating, heart palpitations, um, depression, which would be like sadness, tearfulness, hopelessness, loss of interest in um, normal activities or hobbies, uh, can uh, involve difficulty concentrating, changes in appetite and sleep, um, suicidal ideation. So when we refer to that, that that is expressed um, thoughts of wanting to end someone's life. And that can range anywhere from in passing, you know, I, I don't want to be here anymore to, you know, I'm planning on hurting myself and I have a plan to do that. Um, when we talk about agitation, what we're referring to is like restlessness, emotional distress. Um, it can involve aggression or hostility. Um, aggression, which can be in the form either verbal or physical aggression or um hostile or threatening behavior, um, sundowning. And that when we talk about that, that's kind of the increased confusion, restlessness, anxiety, um, agitation that can occur kind of late afternoon, early evening and extend into the evening hours. Um, delusions, those are those false fixed beliefs. Um, 
that's not based in reality. Like, this is not my home. You are not my wife or husband. Um, I have to go to work. Someone's tried to harm me. Um, I saw, you know, my mother today. Um, hallucinations. And sometimes I think it's hard to distinguish between those. Um, but hallucinations is truly when somebody is, you know, hearing something that, you know, others are not hearing, um, seeing, you know, something that's um, obviously others are not seeing. Um, a lot of times that can be in the form of people or animals. Um, and actually hallucinations can involve any of the senses. So they, you can, they can involve touch, taste, hearing, um, sight, smell. Um, and then anosognosia, I know again, there was a specific question about this. Um, anosognosia is that, I know it's a really long term, um, but it's a, a symptom that can be seen um, in someone that has a diagnosis of dementia um, in patients with um, psychiatric illness, especially like um, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, um, individuals that have strokes that affect certain parts of the brain. Um, and basically what, what this is, is a lack of insight or um, unawareness of um, their, their own illness and the limitations that the illness causes. So basically, you know, I don't have a problem. You know, I'm not sure what you're talking about. You know, I'm, I'm fine. Um, it's very common with the diagnosis of dementia and very challenging. Um, and then just kind of a distinguish, distinction between delirium and dementia-related um, psychiatric symptoms. So you, know, you can see some of these symptoms um, kind of in an acute onset. Um, and typically that's a sign that that's something more um, acutely going on than just, you know, a progression or flare of the dementia. Like if somebody um, has um, an infection or it can be medication related, if they were hospitalized, dehydration, something like constipation can cause what we call an acute delirium. And typically when you see that, it's an acute worsening of confusion. They may start having hallucinations when they've never had those symptoms before or delusions. Um, but that is acute onset. So typically, you know, they didn't have them a few days ago and now they do. Um, versus, you know, somebody that's kind of been like insidious onset, more chronic, kind of progressively worsening. Um, so I just kind of wanted to make a distinction between those two. So as far as, um, you know, how do we manage this, um, you know, kind of day to day. Um, so as far as non-medication management, you know, obviously the, the first thing that we would recommend is managing your own stress as a caregiver. Um, if you're stressed and fatigued, you know, these, these symptoms are going to be infinitely more difficult to manage. I know we say that a lot, it's much easier said than done, you know, while you're kind of in the midst of caregiving, um, but it is very important making sure that you're addressing your own health care needs. Um, you know, to the extent that you're able to engaging in things that, you know, provide stress relief and, and joy, um, taking breaks and, res and getting respite, you know, enlisting help, again, to the extent that that's possible and that you're able to. Um, consider participating and getting support from a support group, therapist or counselor, again, just because I think just in general, caregiving is so difficult. And when you're dealing with these psychiatric symptoms, it's so much more challenging so caring for yourself and, and trying to keep your stress level as low as possible, obviously, will always help. Um, so, um, again, anosognosia was one of the things that was specifically mentioned. This is extremely challenging um, because I think a lot of us, even psychiatrists, a lot of times um, feel they're just being stubborn. You know, they're just they're just in denial, you know, where they just, um, you know, they just don't want to deal with this. They just, you know, are kind of. Um, trying to deny what's happening, but it's it's not. They really, it, it almost would be like somebody saying you have diabetes. And you're like, I know I don't have diabetes. Or um, actually a, a good example from the book is, um, and I'll share this book with you guys. Somebody saying, um, he said, you know, if you were to go home today and somebody said, that's not your home. And you know, you were convinced that it was your home. It's kind of similar to that. Um, so, you know, I know sometimes people want us, you know, to talk to the patient, you know, and, and tell them that they have a diagnosis, but it's not that simple because they truly believe that they don't. And it's not, it is not denial. It is not, um, you know, just being difficult or stubborn. It truly is a symptom of the disease. And oftentimes um, that's when the frontal lobe of the brain is involved. That is the part of the brain that's involved in judgment and reasoning, um, behavior, insight, 
So when that part of the brain is affected from any of these diseases, that um, can contribute to this lack, lack of awareness, so lack of insight. Um, there, there aren't really um, medications specifically necessarily to treat that. Um, so I did want to share this, this book. I know this has been circulating in our office. Um, it's, it's called I'm Not Sick, I Don't Need Help. Um, and it's by um, Xavier Amador. He is a um, trained psychologist, PhD trained psychologist. It, it is more from the perspective of someone that has um, psychiatric illness, but it talks about his program. It's called LEAP, which is basically listening, reflective listening, uh, which is listening without judgment, without comment, um, empathy, you know, trying to identify the emotions behind what someone is saying, um, agreeing, you know, I agree this is difficult. You don't, you don't have to agree with what they're experiencing or agree with their perspective that they're not ill, um, but partnering. So there, there's always something, um, whether we, you know, agree on, you know, the diagnosis or the plan of care, there's always something that we can, you know, agree and partner um, with, you know, with our loved one, whether it be, you know, I want you to stay as independent as possible too. I want you to stay as healthy as possible too. You know, so trying to find those common ground. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and basically, I think his premise is if we can maintain the relationship, oftentimes, you know, and, and find the things that that motivate our loved ones, you know, to, you know, to consider the things that we're, you know, suggesting that, you know, oftentimes we're going to be much more successful than if we're constantly butting heads and arguing. But he goes through his program uh, pretty in depth in the book um, and talks about, you know, Sigosia specifically, um, along with you know, also, you know, kind of the experience of um, inpatient psychiatric care. So I found it to be really helpful. Can you book again? Yes, yeah. it's called I'm Not Sick, I Don't Need Help. Um, How to Help Someone Accept Treatment. And it's by Xavier Amador. Um, I typed it into the chat for anyone who's following on Zoom. And when the video is posted, we'll make sure that it's there underneath. Did yeah. you say the, yeah. you said the L and the E and the A. Oh, yeah. So, um, listen, <laughs> sorry, listening, empathizing, agreeing, and partnering. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, other just kind of on uh, medication um, approaches, picking your battles, you know, if it's not something, you know, that needs to be done now or it's not going to affect um, someone's safety, you know, try, trying to decide, is this something, you know, we want to kind of butt heads over or, um conflict about, or is it something that I can let go? Um, identifying the precipitance to behavior, whether it be bathing, um, you know, having direct conversation or, you know, stressful conversations or certain topics that you can identify that will sort of set someone off. Um, taking medications, dressing. I was taking care of an individual um, with moderately advanced um, dementia at one point, and he would become really combative, resistant, resistant um, during bathing. And we finally realized he was an older gentleman. There was a woman, you know, bathing him that he didn't recognize and kind of come to find out, you know, it, I think it was just the fact that there was a strange woman, you know, that he didn't recognize, you know, with him in an intimate setting. And obviously that was a big precipitant to, you know, to the um, resistive behavior and aggressive behavior. So we're able to kind of adjust things a little bit um, and address that and actually the behaviors improved without medication. Um, trying to avoid correcting, like, um, or using the words can't, don't. Um, instead, redirect, distract, reassure, try to stay calm using reassuring, soft reassuring voices. Um, specifically for hallucinations, you don't have to go along with the hallucination and say, you know, yes, I see it too. Um, but just acknowledging that for them it is real, that it can be very scary, very distressing, and that you're with them and that they're safe. Um, and then medications, um, just to kind of talk very high level of those. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention, weapons. Um, you know, as behaviors are escalating, I know we talk a lot about these, um, you know, this specifically like in care plans and, you know, in business when we're, you know, sort of trying to address those seven major safety concerns that Dr. Edwards, you know, has identified. Um, if at all possible, removing weapons, guns, knives, things like that from the home. If they can't be removed from the home, making sure that they're locked securely. 
I think it was Dr. Chikonis once who told me a story. Um, one of our patients had pretty significant hallucinations, delusions, um, answered the door. The police came to the house, answered the door with a gun in his hand. The police, unfortunately, I mean, they didn't know that it wasn't loaded. Unfortunately, it did not escalate. Um, but just kind of, you know, talking about sort of how do we prevent, you know, prevent problems, prevent things from escalating. Um, that's another thing that I just wanted to mention as much as possible, you know, trying to remove weapons from the home or make sure that they're secured. Um, so medications, just kind of very high level. Um, there are lots of different medications that we will utilize to try to help uh, manage some of the psychiatric symptoms. Um, the goal really is to manage um, distress related to the symptoms. I know Dr. Iyer will often say, you know, somebody has hallucinations, but they're not distressing. They're not bothersome. We don't treat that. You know, um, sometimes they're actually very pleasant, so we wouldn't treat that. But if they're causing distress, you know, to the patient, to the caregiver, or a safety concern, that's what we treat. Um, so the cognitive enhancement medications like um, the remdesivir patch, um, denepazil or Aricept, Momantine, those uh, medications can sometimes help with like apathy, um, agitation, um, other medications like SSRI medications like Lexapro, Sertraline can help with anxiety, depression, um, agitation, paranoia, um, antidepressants like Wobutrin, Mirtazapine, uh, those can help again with mood, um, Trazodone can help, you know, with sleep, anxiety, um, melatonin that can be helpful for sundowning, especially when given at sundown. Um, mood stabilizers uh, like Depakote, Lamictal, sometimes we will use those to kind of help um, yeah. keep some. With the last, the last the, the five here, you know, I can crack it. To... Um, I've just muted everyone. If you have a question, um, go ahead and put it in the chat. And then if we need to turn on your, your mic, we will. But we don't want to accidentally like, hear your conversation. That might not be meant for us. Um, and then just briefly, so benzodiazepines like Xanax, Ativan, we, we typically really try to avoid those medications as much as possible um, just because they can have paradoxical reaction where it can actually cause increased um, agitation. They can increase um, fall risks, sleepiness, and actually increase confusion. But at, there are some occasions where we will utilize those medications. And then antipsychotics um, like putiapine or Seroquel, Risperidone, Abilify, um, those medications can be very helpful, like with hallucinations, delusions, paranoia, those types of symptoms. Yeah, so I think sometimes we can um, kind of do things before we use med medications, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, create a calm environment. <clears throat> so sometimes just dimming the lights. So if people are ramped up, you know, pacing, you know, closing the curtains, that kind of thing. If we just kind of dim the lights, possibly put some soothing music on. Um, sometimes, you know, if they like water, a lot of times people with dementia don't like water, but some, if they still do, you know, maybe a bath. Um, or sometimes just change of environment. So if we're inside and they're, you know, getting anxious, um, irritated, whatever, sometimes just taking them outside on the porch is mm -hmm. helpful or taking them for a walk or even a car ride, you know, just a car ride, taking them out, showing them different, you know, houses or trees blooming or whatever. That's very helpful. Um, so there's a lot of things that we can do for redirection. And then also during um, bathing, um, so really just kind of prepare them, always tell them exactly what you're doing before you do it. Um, make sure the water is a great temperature, you know, warm, not cold, not too hot, that kind of thing. Because we know this population are, they're normally very cold natured. So getting the, the bathroom warm, you know, having a towel maybe warmed up in the dryer, you know, to wrap around them when they're waiting to get in or out of the tub that kind of thing. And then also, you know, a lot of times we'll introduce um, caregivers into the home. So it's kind of strange, right, to have someone come into the house and bathe someone that they don't even know. So kind of, Heather kind of talked about that. Um, so I always say, let's, um, let's kind of make a relationship, you know, get the person 
um, to know the individual a little bit before. Have them come over, play games with them, color, take them for walks or whatever, and develop a little relationship before we just go ahead and go to, into the bathroom and start, you know, okay, we're dressing now and going into the shower. So that kind of thing is, is helpful as well. Um, so if we get into helping tips, and Heather has really explained a lot of the clinical medical side as well. Um, I, as a caregiver, I like to tell people, um, you know, your loved ones are typically reacting to you, um, your senses, your your nervousness, um, their senses are picking up on it. So these skills are necessary to keep them calm as well as you calm. And, and that's kind of the name of the game. Now, there are a lot of times you don't have control of it because it's their brain. Um, so a lot of times your tolerance is what's going to determine if, um, if it's managed and how it's managed before it gets to the crisis. So once you've past that. When is when? When is a crisis, right? So a lot of times a crisis will look like somebody who's manic, just running around, um, you know, speaking really like off, off reality, um, threatening you to anger and agitation. So the things that are kind of more of that bizarre behavior. So if you can't catch it before the crisis, which would be you would be coming in the office, getting some of them on these mood stabilizers, management, um, you need to make sure that you have a crisis plan, which I know Lisa is going to talk about some more, but part of that is understanding um, threats and action. So when somebody says they're going to harm you with dementia or any condition, you need to take them for their word. And so at that point, I tell people you, you need to give them like three to five feet so you're not in their personal space and triggering them and see if they can dis de-escalate. Now, if they're threatening and already attach it with the behavior, then you're already in the crisis. So what we're trying to do is catch before the crisis where they're threatening, you get them to the doctors, you utilize meds and all other means to get them back calm. But if they're threatening and doing behaviors, then you're, you're in the crisis, which means at that point, you're in danger and probably need to start implementing a care plan or a crisis plan. Um, that's why it's so important for caregivers to manage their stress and, and staying out of that burnout phase is um, keeping yourself within capacity because you've got to make a lot of judgment calls because it's a slow boil. You may be like, oh, he'll, this will pass. And then before you know it, you're in, a, you're in a predicament that you didn't catch prior to the crisis. Like you endured it too long um, and you didn't tell people because you're like, oh, I've got this. Um, so that's important to understand. Um, and I think, do you want to talk about your crisis plan? Yeah. So, so some, some people have said, well, when do you know you're in crisis? When you have that, that gut reaction, that fear, that, oh my gosh, this, this is so not him. There's another level of that that's telling you, warning you, right? And so it's okay to call 911. It's okay to call for help. It's okay at that point you probably are already seeing it escalate. Listen to you. You know, you, it, you're not over responding and you're not being unreasonable. So don't, don't be ashamed of it. Don't feel embarrassed. Again, it's not your loved one. It's the brain. And so you can't control that. You can't use the techniques you used when y'all were earlier as a parent or as a spouse, like how you would kind of work them for a little extra money or um, get that, get that extra thing or whatever. This is, this is different. So um, yeah. Yeah. And you, you never think that your loved one is going to hurt you, right? Because you know, this person, you've lived with them for a long time and they would never want to hurt you. And they, they don't. It's the disease that, that you're seeing, not the person that you're married to or your father or your mother or whatever, um, the thing is that they can still be very strong too. So we just have to make sure that you're safe. And we have so many caregivers that we counsel about this because they just, um, you know, they feel that love for someone. They they worry about, you know, the, well, the first thing, they don't think that anything's going to happen, like they won't hurt them. Um, but they don't want to, you know, place them when they're having these um, scary feelings like they might be hurt and that kind of thing too. So 
before um, placement, I would say we, we want to make sure that they're safe in the home. Come up with that crisis plan. Always have your phone with you and always have keys. I have one caregiver that she wears her key around her neck all the time, even when she's sleeping at night. So she can get out and you know lock the house if her husband becomes violent. And there's times when he's very, very sweet. And there's times when he has been violent. And she has had to get out of the house. So get out of the house and then call 911 with the cell phone and then make sure that, um, you know, if you have someone kind of on standby, such as a neighbor, um, a friend, a family member, call them that they can be with you. And I know, Heather, that you said that the when you call 911, you can specific, specifically ask for what the crisis um Crisis outline or what yeah, is that? Yeah, so just um, a couple of resources that we wanted um, everybody to be aware of because a lot of times, unfortunately, I think, you know, you get into these situations a lot of times it's at night, you know, when our office may be closed, you know, or, or you, you're you up with, you know, your loved one and, um, you know, by yourself. Um, so a couple of resources. Um, there are 24-hour behavioral, um, behavioral health lines, both through Novant and Atrium. So if you're not sure, you know, is this something, you know, is this something that I'm going to need to seek inpatient, you know, treatment for or not? They're always available to kind of walk you through that and triage uh, whatever, you know, symptoms that you're seeing. Um, you know, if someone is expressing suicidal ideations, this is a suicide helpline. Um, there are mobile crisis services um, through the South Carolina Department of Mental Health and also Mecklenburg County has one as well. Um, and those numbers um, are actually, so we, we do have an acute psychiatric um, management on our Take Charge Live website now. Um, and it has um, information about um, local emergency rooms. If you do need to seek um, psychiatric evaluation, how to, how to go about that, because typically they, um, I know Ashley's going to talk about this a little bit more, but typically that is the way to facilitate, um, you know, evaluation and potentially inpatient care. Um, but it has that information. It has information for the local um, inpatient psychiatric facilities. Um, it has information about, you know, when is inpatient care or when is psychiatric evaluation warranted. And I think exactly like the ladies were saying, you know, if, if you are, if, if the person is in danger of hurting themselves or hurting someone else, that's a crisis. That's, that's the time um, to take that next step. Um, but what Lisa was mentioning. So when you do call the police department or call 911, explain the situation to them, you know, let them know, that, you know, it's my loved one. They have a diagnosis of dementia, or cognitive impairment, um, you know, and the, they're having, you know, aggressive behavior related to that. So they know it's not, they're not responding to a, a criminal offense or some type of criminal um, activity. Um, that way they can kind of approach the situation, you know, sensitively and appropriately. Um, but you can specifically request a crisis intervention team or what's called a community policing re crisis response team, which is a community-based program that brings together law enforcement, mental health professionals, mental health advocates to better respond to mental health crises. So those individuals, police officers um, or mental health professionals, they have special training, um, oftentimes quite a few hours of special training and how to respond um, to these situations that are more mental health related. So if you do call, uh, make sure that you specify, you know, or ask if they have a, a crisis um, intervention team. Um, and I think, you know, kind of like the ladies were saying, you know, I, I know there's a lot of emotion and guilt potentially about, you know, taking that step and, and calling, you know, for help mm -hmm. when you get to that point. Um, but it, it's for your own safety and for their own safety. Mm -hmm. So it's more than a bad mood or like them just getting angry for just a second. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, it's a, behavior that just won't turn off, you know? And so a lot of times you have to know one, when is when? Like you all, anyone who deals counseling with me, you will always hear that question. When is when? When will you know there is, it, you are in the crisis? So go ahead now when you're in a good spot to draw that line. Um, for me, that would be like, you can probably yell some things at me for about a minute and then like walk off and then we're separated. Now, if you yell at me and then you come at me, that that's aggression. And then if you yell at me, come at me and threaten me, then I'm taking you serious. So that's that's no longer my loved one. I mean, something has done something to their brain or you've triggered them 
to flip their lid, right? And so they're in the limbic system of fight, flight, and freeze, and they're choosing to fight. So there could be some mental health issues that now that you've lost the capacity to kind of filter that in coping skills, it's coming out. Like there are many reasons and it can sometimes gradually go or sometimes people one day it just happens. So do be aware of that. So typically, like you said, you will call 911 if you're really in a big crisis and can't get somebody to an emergency room. But how that looks is you will then go to the emergency room, whether it's an ER at a hospital or, or the ER at a mental health or behavioral health facility, like one down this down this way. Um, you can pick whichever one you want. And so you typically, you always have to go through the ER to be evaluated. They do and assess to deem them psych inpatient appropriate. And that can look like a 24 hour to a three day observation before they're admitted. And this is where it gets really confusing for some people because they're like, well, she's just sitting in the room or he's sitting in the room. Um, they haven't admitted them yet or they told me they're going to, but why won't they put them in the room? And it may be they need to hold them there for a little while longer before they even take them on the unit because they're, they're, they might harm somebody. So, you know, it's a process that isn't like when you go in and you just need stitches. So do be aware that they will, it will take some time. Um, there will be an assessment and then they'll deem either appropriate or inappropriate based on what you're bringing them in for, whether it's um, aggression or self-harm or harm to others um, and or their manic or, or whatever the case is. Um, and then once they're admitted, they will um, find a place and what they call an open bed in a unit. And this is where we like to really advocate, which is you're going to ask for a geriatric psych inpatient bed. And you can say that when you're in the ER with the psychiatrist or the other people. Like, we don't want any mental health facility or behavioral health. We would prefer a, a geriatric. And they have those. So the, the individuals of older adults actually have a separate unit that is away from all of that, just like the children do. And I highly recommend that because it's a different population and it's a different management and it's less stressful. Like people aren't running around and, and things like that. And so, that, but, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, kind of going back to the emergency room, just um, because I know this has happened. We've had situations where we really felt strongly that somebody needed, you know, psychiatric evaluation and inpatient care. And they've been, you know, evaluated and turned away from the emergency room. So just, I just want to... Um, I guess, put that out there. Even if um, we seek emergency room psychiatric evaluation, there is not a guarantee that they will be admitted to the hospital, mm -hmm. um, which is really frustrating. So a couple of things um, that I would recommend, you know, if we get to this point and you're, you're, you're taking that next step of seeking evaluation and, you know, obviously hoping for inpatient care to stabilize someone, you know, um, one one thing that was actually mentioned in the, the book is that, you know, if if um, your loved one has, you know, turned over furniture and things like that at the house, don't clean that up before the police officers get there because you want them to understand the situation. Mm -hmm. um, be that be their advocate. Explain if someone was was being aggressive and threatening you, don't be ashamed to share that, you know, with both, you know, the, the people that come to the house and respond, but also the, the emergency room team, you really need to paint the picture as much as you can about, you know, why you felt like you bought this type of care, why you thought that this was necessary. Um, so as, as much information as you can give them is, you know, as descriptive as you can be about what was happening, um, that will at least increase the likelihood that they will, um, decide you know to pursue their patient treatment mm -hmm. why when the emergency team comes mm -hmm. after you dial 911 mm -hmm. and they want to take your loved one into a separate room mm -hmm. to question him after they hear my story and all of a sudden you have a reversal everything's fine i didn't okay. do that mm -hmm. no i don't want to go to the hospital I don't, nothing wrong with me. Yeah. And so you, you, you don't, that's before yeah. the power of attorney thing happened. And right. so you have no yeah. recourses to what to follow through. So right. next. Yeah. yeah. So I hope that sometimes I tell people just have a packet of information that if you have something that says of a diagnosis, mm -hmm. when those people get there, the police officers, you have 
like something from MMC that says mm -hmm. his name and that he's got mm -hmm. dementia and that, you know, that they oh. can at least, uh, even if you can't enact the power of attorney, you've at least shown, mm -hmm. okay, well, at clinic, like we, this well, is I think this was even before yeah. uh, we were here. Yeah. It's treating it. So, okay. well, and but I if think, you have a diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. And that might be why it's helpful if, if there is a crisis intervention team, because they are trained, you know, to respond to mental health crisis and that I think oftentimes it's not uncommon where they'll show up and suddenly they're fine and mm -hmm. they're not hearing voices and they're not saying things and they're not hurting. They don't have they, a knife in their hand. Right, exactly. Right. Um, because some, I mean, sometimes people know what to say too, you know, mm -hmm. when they show up and they don't. Very sociable. Yeah. Yes. Um, and you could ask them, like, we need to do a cognitive evaluation, like, yeah. a, like a quick little, who's the like, you know, they can run through something and somewhere along there, there will be a yeah. discrepancy enough that, They'll be able to do it. Like you, you, you can ask questions. You're like, oh, oh, something just off. And if you feel like you were in danger, let them know that I feel like I'm in danger. You know, right. and this is why because they'll take that more seriously. And they ask uh, such specific session uh, yeah. questions like, yeah. "Did he push you? Did he touch you with mm -hmm. the knife? Did yeah. he? You know?" And so, yeah. And in all honesty, you're so nervous right. that you just blurt out what happens. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes it comes out even you sound worse than what you actually went through because yeah. it's so scary. Yeah, it yeah. is very scary. Yeah. 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 It's stressful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, remember, you're being placed in a plate, uh, an area that your body says you're being abused. Mm -hmm. But he has dementia, so you can't abandon him. Right. Right. Like, and that's a very contrasting yeah. experience. Like, you are in the stress response, but yet you don't get to walk away from it. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not a, it's a unnatural response in a unnatural situation. After yeah. I called the nine one one, I went outside. That was good. I left. Yeah. Just remove yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Took the knife and then left. Yeah. yeah. And that's even in arguments. I often say, just remove yourself. Mm -hmm. Just go remove yourself. Let them calm down. Yeah. Right. And they will. They will but calm down. when it's, Usually they will calm down if you yeah. leave. But when in doubt, please get a professional and 911 or take them to the ER mm -hmm. and, and just get the help you need. Mm -hmm. And do not feel bad about calling. If you feel threatened or feel that you're in danger or your loved one is in danger, do not feel bad about calling. They they respond to these types of calls frequently. You know, you're not bothering them. They're doing their job. So I know sometimes people are hesitant to call for that reason. But if, if you've gotten to that point, it's the first time for you, but it's about the exactly that's right. millionth time for yeah. them. Right. So, right. Exactly. And so a lot of times when people get toward the ER, you're assessed, they deem you either you are appropriate for inpatient or you're not, this is where people feel abandoned a lot of times by the system, whether that's sometimes by your doctor and sometimes it is feel, felt and experienced that MMC ditched us mm -hmm. or I ditched you or mm -hmm. they they kicked us out of the ER. Like we don't have control of what they assess and how they deem it mm -hmm. in the mission. The other part is once they're admitted, nobody else can go beyond that to touch your loved one medically. So they are now in an inpatient and that is the professional people seeking or giving their care. So like you can't really call and da -da 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 -da. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can't give any orders. Yeah. You know, we're not mm -hmm. going to take orders from Dr. Chaconis or whoever. Exactly. Um, yeah. They have to use the hospitalist in there. And but I mean we appreciate those calls though when when you're in that situation and you have a loved one in the hospital update us and maybe we can offer something to you mm -hmm. and if nothing else just an ear to listen to mm -hmm. you know yeah and we're always available i mean a lot of times they um aren't necessarily receptive to us calling and giving report or communicating right. with our staff but we are always happy to give that background to give that history you know so that they kind of have um, an understanding of what you know your loved one's baseline is so if they're looking for that and willing to talk with us, we are always happy to do that. That's not always the case, um, but yeah, certainly and we're during the COVID. It was yeah worse. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that the communication worse. can't be person to person. Right. A so lot of phone yeah. calling and yeah. oh man. Yeah. So a lot of the stays can be three days. It can be five days. We've had two weeks. 
Mm -hmm. um, that what they're trying to do is get your person stabilized, probably with med management. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they're changing meds, they're taking them up. And I'm going to tell you, it is better that they do it in there than you try to do this at home because those changes do bring around bizarre behavior sometimes. Like sometimes how somebody has a response that's not good. And I know we have about 15 more minutes. So I'm going to let Lisa discuss once that time frame is done, they're stabilized and they're deemed okay to be discharged. You got to build a discharge plan and, and that can look um, different for everybody. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we want to make sure that those discharge instructions are understood clearly, you know, so sometimes there's a lot of change in medication. So just make sure that you ask questions. It's always good to have another person there with you at discharge. So they hear what's being said at discharge. And then we normally will get um, the hospitalization records from um, the hospital stay, but you can always make sure that, you know, we are faxed the records um, and we have other ways of getting them too, but we want to make sure that we have the medication list that um, that is most current. So make sure that you um, go over that. And then we'll want to make sure that we have a follow-up visit scheduled with us so we can, um, you know, we can see the patient and go over medications and make sure that they're working. They might need tweaked a little bit. There might be medications that we'll only use for a little bit of time, and then we'll slowly come off of them. So, you know, our doctors here work with those medications all the time. Um, you know, sometimes in those inpatient settings, I know that we don't really like to use um, Haldol. So that's kind of one medication that I always hear the physicians say, you know, that we don't really like to use. So that's kind of nice to have in the back of your mind too for those inpatient site um, admissions. But um, but yes, yeah, schedule a follow-up appointment with one of the providers. It might be a mid-level provider, one of the PAs, nurse practitioners, and maybe not an MD, but get in there and um, so we can see. And then um, you know, it might be that you need some other resources too after being discharged, maybe some in-home uh, caregivers. And we can help you with companies that can resource you with that, those people or um, day programs or um, respite for you. You know, it's important for your care team to come up with a plan. So again, I think it was said here, you know, we need to make sure that we're um, taking care of ourselves. So have um, a plan in place to be able to get some respite and that kind of thing. Um, but again, just know that those medications, when they're changed, they're not always something that is going to stay on their um, medication list forever. You know, we, you know, a lot of times these behaviors will kind of calm down as the person progresses. So, um, and those medications sometimes look a little scary when you're looking at them, um, you know, on the internet reviewing those side effects and things so it can be kind of scary so you just kind of have to trust the process but also you know the, our physicians will look at those medications um, that they have uh, ordered or changed and and will you know kind of eyeball them to see if they we feel that they're safe or safe doses and that kind of thing and hopefully they work you know some of these medications take a little while to work too and then you also have the disease that's <laughs> playing a part in the way the patient is responding. So, you know, is it the disease? Is it the medications? Are they side effects? So that's why we're here, too, to kind of help you um, figure that those kind of questions out. Did you miss anything? No, I think the last thing, and then we can open it for questions, is, um, you know, probably one thing we see a lot is upon discharge, the medication administration like what they prescribe when they leave. A lot of times people um, take it upon themselves as a primary caregiver to rearrange those meds or they're like, it's making him or her too sleepy or she sleeps too more, much. What you have to remember is that person just went through a very high energy experience, like draining. And so I expect them to come back calmer. I expect them to come back and, and needing to repair and recalculate and their brain to just, you know, kind of um, realign with the new meds. And so like Lisa was saying, make sure you remember like they're sleeping now. 
then in one week, they're going to look different because the meds have taken place or, or over time you can decrease them. But please, if there's anything you hear today, stick with the discharge meds as they have been ordered. Mm -hmm. When you start changing them, we have what we call the back to back effect. Like when you change them, they're going right back in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's it. That's kind of it, right? Yeah. So I think we'll open it for questions. Yeah. I think the other thing um, we just wanted to um, sort of reinforce too, because I think this has been surprising um, to a lot of folks that have had to go through the emergency room and seek inpatient care is wait times can be extended. Um, you know, when you're when you're in the emergency room and waiting for evaluation from the psychiatrist, whether that be, you know, via telemedicine or in person, that there can be, you know, a, an extended wait for the evaluation. And then once they determine whether inpatient care is appropriate or not, bed availability, waiting on bed availability, that can also be extended wait time, sometimes a week, sometimes more. Um, so again, not to put you off, but just, you know, again, I think sometimes we've had feedback that um, that, that was part of the process that, you know, wasn't understood or, or expected. And it might not be in Charlotte. They might have to go an hour, two and a half hours away or whatever for their uh, geriatric. Um, and that's okay, because they're getting yeah, one yeah, of a geriatric is, unit. Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. So we have had some questions in the chat box here. Um, there's a few that are just kind of clarification questions. Maybe we can just knock those out quickly, and then the others might be a little bit more discussion. Um, someone asked, did you say that diazepam was helpful for agitation? So diazepam, um, Valium is the other name for that. That is one of those benzodiazepines. Um, it's used on rare occasion. It's certainly not one of our first line medications because of the potential side effects that we talked about, you know, paradoxical reaction where it can actually cause worsening of anxiety or agitation, um, increased confusion, somnolence, increased fall risk. So it's probably not one that we use routinely, uh, but there are some occasions where we, you know, for anxiety or, you know, when we've tried, you know, multiple other medications that haven't been successful, um, you know, there certainly are some patients, um, a handful of patients that are on that medication. Um, benzodiazepines sometimes are utilized too for folks that have Parkinson's disease and have like REM sleep behavior disorder at nighttime. Um, so that's another occasion that we'll use them. But it just in general, you know, we try to avoid the benzodiazepines that class, the diazepam, the clonazepam, Xanax, Ativan, um, you know, at least initially just because of the potential side effects. Um, okay. There was, there was another one that was here pretty straightforward. When feeling threatened, do you recommend 911 versus the South Carolina Mobile Crisis Hotline? Um, I mean, I think probably if you're feeling like imminently threatened, I probably would call 911 and then see if they have the crisis um, intervention team because they're probably going to triage it with someone locally anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably, I mean, if you're in imminent danger, that's probably the fastest way to get help. Um, okay, and should we start at the beginning with these? We have someone who has said, my wife, of seven, who's 72 years old, has Alzheimer's and has developed an alcohol problem. She's never had a consumption problem before, and it's getting worse as time goes on. Has anyone experienced this, and can anyone suggest what can be done? I really try to avoid getting my wife irritated or depressed. So you kind of got, I'll let you chime in, but you kind of got two different things going on. One is the inability to understand that she's had a glass. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have another glass. So please understand this is not, the consumption of overconsumption is not the same as if I went out and like had eight drinks. Like there's almost like I forgot I had one. Um, so you are going, you are going to have to be the siphon of it, the bartender. Yeah. There are different ways of doing that. We can give you tips, but there's also the second component of how you go about it, which is why she gets angry. Um, and so, you know, some of these can just be the tips of just how do you approach them? What distraction can you give? Can you take the white wine and look, mix it with like a LaCroix and you have it too and you make it funny? Or do you just say, we're going to have a dry January? Like, you know, we can figure out the other um, permissive deceptions of how to go through navigating and kind of like I call the sales pitch. Well, they have non-alcoholic um, yeah. wines and, you know, like you say, diluting it is great too, but I've even had people where they'll take a, 
a regular bottle of wine, whatever their wine of choice is, and then fill it yes. with the non-alcoholic wine. <laughs> so they're like fooling them. But um, <clears throat> there's all kinds of things that people do. And I think they have um, actually, I think there's a website, alcohol.com or something, where they have non-alcoholic liquors too. I think the darker liquors, there's not any um, like non-alcoholic versions, but you know, like the vodkas and that kind of thing, there are some choices. So being creative, um, limiting, it's hard sometimes when the people are still driving and able to go get their own alcohol, that becomes a little bit tricky, but um, sometimes you just have to be very creative. Over holidays, we often use cranberry juice mm -hmm. in their wine glass. And yeah, this is the best wine I've had. <laughs> it's tasty. <Awesome>. Yeah. <laughs> when I think, you know, just addressing kind of probably what that stems from is kind of like we were talking about before. I mean, especially if there isn't, you know, a history of that, um, you know, with the when the certain areas of the brain, especially the frontal lobe of the brain is affected. I mean, it affects the judgment, the reasoning, impulse control. Um, you know, sometimes people, you, you know, you put a plate in front of them and they'll just keep eating unless you limit, you know, what's in front of them. So, you know, obviously, um, I think that's probably all part of that, but, you know, I think some of the and you're not going to be able to explain it to get the permission you right. need from your loved one to say that, okay, I got it. Mm -hmm. So again, you got to have this, what I call the Santa Claus effect of what's your pitch going to be? What, what kind of carrot can you dangle out there and how, to, how can you kind of navigate the um the permissive deception of what is going to happen the cranberry juice mm -hmm. or do we put this to the non-alcoholic in the wine bottle because she has to see the wine bottle but the important thing is just try different things and see mm -hmm. what what comes about it but don't use words don't use words mm -hmm. that's just going to frustrate them mm -hmm. um i should also say i'm reading these from the chat box but if um if anyone has a question that they would like to speak just turn your microphone on and have at it um, we've got this person who has, has been through it. Um, they wrote, I've been there twice, sent by, me by memory care facility to the ER at behavioral health. Both times I was sent, they, uh, he was sent back to the memory care facility in my vehicle with just the two of us. Memory care facility said to insist on admission, behavioral health would not keep him. Ended up being sent to a facility more than two hours away that did not admit him. Um, and then... She went on, thankfully, memory and movement helped me through the next 67 days, eventually into the correct facility. It is not easy to get through. Faith got us through this, and memory and movement is an incredible resource. Thank you. Glad we could help. Um, did you describe the test using the swab for the red, green, red, and yellow psychiatric medications? We have not talked about no. that. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so we have two uh, tests that we do. We do the gene site and the genome mine, but it basically is a very non invasive test. It's this little swab, like a Q tip that we swab on the inside of the mucous membrane, and then we send it off for um, to a lab, and they can determine which medications work um, with the person's make genetic makeup. And it's very helpful because it does uh, categorize the medications into three categories, a green, yellow, and red. So we can determine which uh, medications in the green area, you know, they work best with the person and then the yellow area. And they even say, um, they give us information such as like, this medication works in lower doses instead of higher doses with the person's genetic makeup. So... We use them quite often, um, but it's for psychotropic medications. It's not for like blood pressure medicines or diabetes medications. You know, it's for psychotropic medications. Um, there's just one other thing I was going to mention because I've unfortunately had that situation a lot too, working in long term care communities where um, the facility will, you know, insist on, you know, sending the um, individual to the emergency room for evaluation. And it's just kind of a, revolving door where they're not admitted and then um, but sometimes there are behavioral health uh, practitioners whether it be a psychiatrist or a behavioral health nurse practitioner or physician assistant that will come to the memory care facilities or to the long-term care communities um, and sometimes enlisting their help and managing the 
behavioral symptoms, obviously they can see them on a pretty, pretty regular basis. They can adjust medication. Um, they're at the facility. They're working with the staff there at the facility. So I think they feel supported and that they're able to kind of communicate their concerns and, um, you know, know that they're working towards, you know, better management of the behavior. But sometimes that is an option and sometimes that can kind of stop that cycle um, of continuing to be, you know, sent out to the hospital. So that might be um, something to consider if, if that's happening, just asking the facility if they have a behavioral health um, or a, a behavioral health specialist that comes there to the facility to see the patients and help with management of psychiatric symptoms. Thank you. Um, there's one more question here in the chat. Ooh, another one just popped up. Um, how would you deal with the adult child who does not believe one spouse's account of potential violence from the other? Hmm. Maybe that one Yeah. How would you deal with the adult child who does not believe one spouse's account of potential violence? This is for someone in my support group. So a lot of times that is the child's inability to view a parent as declining. So a lot of that is kind of going to be more uh, therapeutic. And I often tell caregiver, just, you know, you tell them, you report, but you're not in the job to enlighten anyone, like if they're not on board. So part of that is, you know, do you, do you have the capability of recording, like videoing it and sending it to them because there's nothing like a picture? Or, you know, is it just a constant debate and argument, you know, it, at some point, you just have to say they're not on board and you need to move, proceed accordingly. So it just depends on how much help you need from that adult child, I think. Mm -hmm. um, another tip someone mentioned here, hospice and palliative care may also be able to help monitor medications. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, there was one question you got to this one that was submitted in advance. Um, is it, you might have addressed this a little bit, is it common for a person with dementia to just place all of his anger and frustration on the caregiver? And if you're unable to leave your home to protect yourself from the person's verbal abuse, what would you recommend? It's very common for the primary caregiver to yeah. get the blunt end um, of everything. Close. Yeah. And you're the one, you have to remember, you're the one that they see as a threat of taking their autonomy away. That is a brain-driven thing. That is not autonomy like, this is my right to have freedom. That's the part people get it confused with. So a lot of times it's like people on the, in, on the spectrum. It's called the persistent desire for autonomy. And so their brain really thinks that there is a, a life-threatening threat to their, their body when you make decisions for them. And so really what I try to do is help my clients and um, – figure out how to reframe questions or the way they're going about it is really what, what it is. Um, or like Lisa said, ask permission. If they're in that phase where instead of me just grabbing, I need to say, can I use your arm and can we brush your hair? Um, so it just depends where they are and you can kind of get coached on that or directed. But, but remember their experiences, you're taking something away from them. Yeah, and I think, you know, just generally, so I know the question was specifically about verbal abuse, obviously verbal and physical abuse is, you know, are two different scenarios. But I think, you know, to the extent that you're able to setting boundaries, um, you know, when that occurs, you remove yourself, you know, from the room, um, from the home. You, I mean, again, you know, managing your own stress and kind of having other support systems in place, because um, that's very challenging. Um you know, there's someone else that's gonna say. Um, oh, I think just you know having respite, obviously having some breaks because if you're constantly experiencing that, it, it's gonna wear you down. Mm -hmm. But there are medications too that can help with somebody that is just kind of you know agitated and irritable and angry all the time. Mm -hmm. There are medicines that can kind of help them um, take that edge off too. So please, if that's happening, please let us know. Um, I mean, if, if any of these things are happening, obviously we want to know about it. Um, medicines aren't always 100%, you know, miracle, but there's always something more that we can do and we will work with you guys as much, you know, as much as possible to, you know, to manage those symptoms and give you techniques um, and also make sure that you're getting the support that you need. Yeah, just like personal care, you know, a lot of times people get very anxious around personal care, even with their loved one or spouse or whatever. 
And that's one thing that's very hard to medicate out. Um, it's just, you know, we can use medications, we can try, but usually it's it's not something a medication is going to work on. Um, then it's more direct redirection. Um, you know, anxiety too. Sometimes with dementia, anxiety is really bad with these um, this population. And sometimes it's, you just can't medicate the anxiety piece out of them. You know, it, I wish we could, but <clears throat> sometimes it's very hard. And so some of those things we talk about, you know, distracting, reassuring, providing a snack, you know, using soothing music. Um, some of those things can be helpful too, you know, letting again, talking through kind of what you're doing before you're going to do it. Um, Change the environments. Can, yeah. Try to help come up with some strategies based on the specific situation. Thank you. Um, if there are any other questions, now's the time. I just wanted to um, kind of reinforce too. So, you know, there's no way that we could possibly, you know, get um, go into depth on all of these things that we talked about today as much as we would want to. But there are a lot of resources um, on our Take Charge um, library as far as like communication techniques, um, how to manage, you know, delusions, hallucinations, sundowning, um, how to access um, acute psychiatric um, evaluation and care. So please do um, use, utilize that resource. Uh, like I said, there are a lot of, there's a lot of information on there that we couldn't go into as much depth as um, we would have liked due to time constraints, but there's a lot of good resources on our website. And there, and there are local resources that can do dementia training. And I often tell loved ones, you know, that's a great resource like Angela Burrow. Um, that way you really do learn more about the brain and don't always personalize that that's your spouse or your, or your um, parent that mm -hmm. is doing that to you. Um, and it gives you the skills and the, the tool, tools to utilize. Um, if anyone is wondering how to find this magical library that Heather mentioned, um, at the top of, if you go to our website, at the top of every page, um, there's a menu bar, and just click on education, and a drop-down menu of chop, little chapters under education will come down. One of those is Take Charge Library. Um, another one is Take Charge Live, which is what this program is, is part of. And at that tab, you'll find recordings of the last two years of these programs, and uh, in a few days, this one. Um, and you'll also find a little questionnaire. Um, it's a very short little form. If you have any ideas for a topic that you would like to see addressed in Take Charge Live, um, this caregiver strategy series really came from caregivers asking for information about topics. And so we really want these to be as useful for you um, and informative for you. We know that your time is precious. And if you're giving us an hour, we want to make it worth it. So if there's something you'd like to hear more about, um, fill in that two-second form, hit send, it comes to me, and we will be on it. So thank you very much, and um, have a great evening. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.